Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm Ellen Letvin, and I'm the Vice President for Science and Education at Pacific Science Center. And more relevant to this evening's work, I'm the uh, director of the Seattle Science Festival. As So, as a major cultural organization in the region, the Science Center is the lead organization of the Science Festival, but we didn't do it in any way without the, hap the help of many sponsors, dozens of organizations, and hundreds of volunteers who have all united with us to help make this festival happen. And it is with a huge sense of pride that I welcome you all to this opening event. So the next 10 days, as many of you know, are gonna be filled with amazing events that are gonna happen throughout the region that are going to celebrate what a tech town Seattle really is and to help us to elevate awareness of how important science and technology are to our region's culture and to its prosperity. But about tonight, tonight we have a spectacular program for you. We have three of the world's top physicists who are also outstanding communicators. We also are happy to, to share with you the West Coast premiere of an innovative multimedia work that uh, represents basically a pure integration of science and the arts. And uh, it's called Icarus at the Edge of Time. Many of you may have heard of it, but it is truly enlightening and inspiring. So we're very happy to be able to offer that this evening. And we really hope among the many things we hope this evening will bring to you, that it will fire up your imagination and curiosity and encourage you to really think about the fact that science is, and scientific inquiry is really integral to the human condition and really fuels our uh, curiosity of life and our economic growth and also is integral to our culture. But before we get things underway, I would really like to thank the many companies and organizations that have made the Science Festival possible. And in particular, I want to note that the Seattle Center and the Boeing Company have been key supporters of this endeavor. And there are many other sponsors that are mentioned in your program, and I'd like for all of us to give them a hand right now. So the last thing I'd like to mention is that your feedback is critical to us. One of the key things that's enabled us to really learn about how the Science Festival can evolve is through your feedback. And so we have volunteers here who have some uh, surveys that we would like for you to fill out to give us feedback. And for those of you who would prefer to do it online, our website also has a survey that you can use to provide us with your feedback. But please, it means a lot to us, so I hope you'll take the time to do so. And so, without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Jennifer Ouellette, who's a well-known author and journalist and is going to be the MC for the evening. So, Jennifer. Welcome. Oh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, many of you may not know this, I'm a local girl by birth. I grew up in Renton, Washington, so this is doubly special for me to come here and uh, host this event. Um, we're going to be looking at some very, very big questions uh, in physics tonight. We're going to be looking at the nature of reality, questions of what is time. We're going to be diving down into the depths of a black hole and going out to the furthest reaches of the universe amidst all those galaxies. These are really, really big issues, big ideas, but they all start with little children asking big questions and wondering about the nature of the world. They start with curiosity and discovery. When I was a little girl growing up in Renton, Washington, I lived for every Saturday because that's when my mother, who's in the audience tonight with my father, um, would take me to the local library, the Renton Public Library, and I would get to pick out my books for the week. And I lived for that. I would get lost among the stacks. Unbeknownst to me, on the other side of the country, just outside of Philadelphia, there was a little boy who also lived to go to the local public library. And he would go and pick out his books and he would lose himself in the stacks. What he was reading were books about the stars, books about the universe, about reality, about physics. He fell in love with it, and he ended up deciding that he wanted to be 
a, a, a physicist, an astronomer of some sort. In fact, when he was in junior high, uh, his teacher asked him what he wanted to be and said, oh, I, I understand you want to be like an astronomer or a scientist. And he goes, I want to be a theoretical physicist. <laughs> Very, and, and he did not waver. He ended up getting a degree, an undergraduate degree, uh, and going on to get a graduate degree. He became a physicist. He became a professor. He lectured. He wrote books. He did research papers. And somewhere along the way, he met that little girl who had grown up to be a science writer, and he married her. And uh, we live happily ever after in Los Angeles, California. <laughs> This is our first speaker tonight. I'm very proud to introduce um, Sean Carroll. Whenever I talk about time, people always want to know, what is time? What does the word mean? And this is a little surprising in some sense because time is the single most frequently occurring noun in the English language you'd think we would have some idea what the word means. And I want to argue that we do have some idea what the word means. When you're told, you know, the event tonight begins at 8 p.m., you're not baffled, right? You're not like, oh, what does that possibly mean, 8 p.m.? I've never heard of that before. You, you know what to do. We know how time actually works in the universe. Basically, time is a label. The universe has space all around us, there's stuff, there's people, there's matter and energy, and the universe happens over and over again with that stuff in slightly different places. Time is just a label that we give to all the different moments in the history of the universe, like pages on a book or frames in a film reel. And we can tell time, right? We can measure it, we can do science to it. We tell time using clocks. So what is a clock? A clock is just something that does the same thing predictably over and over again. We know that as you go from summer to winter and back to summer, the sun is going to rise and set 365 and a quarter times every single time. When the little hand goes around the clock once, the big hand is going to go around 12 times. These days we build atomic clocks that can measure time to exquisite accuracy. And nevertheless, we show up late for all sorts of appointments. Why is it that we have some notion of how time passes, but we're not perfectly accurate? It's because you are full of clocks. Your body has clocks, things that do the same thing over and over again. Your breathing, the electrochemical pulses in your nervous system, and your heartbeat. But these clocks are not perfectly good. When you can't tell time very well, this is not physics fault, this is your fault. This guy, Galileo, one of the, that's Galileo, right? There he is. Uh, one of the founders of modern physics, but he was a young kid once. He went to church on Sunday. His attention would occasionally wander. He would look at this. This is actually the chandelier in the church in Pisa. You can still visit it today, right outside the Leaning Tower. And Galileo watched the chandelier rock back and forth. And he noticed something that you or I, not being Galileo, would not notice. He noticed that it always took the same amount of time to go back and forth. How did he know that? He timed it using his pulse. You can imagine the young teenager Galileo like looking at the chandelier as the sermon is going on, counting his heartbeats. Both the chandelier and his heartbeat are pretty good clocks. So in fact, time is not that mysterious at all. We can use it, we can measure it, we can put it to work. Where the mysteries come in are in the aspects of time. There are certain features that time has that we certainly don't yet understand. So one of them is, why is there a direction to time? What I mean by that is, you know, here on Earth, we can certainly tell the difference between up and down. When you drop something, it falls down. But we don't think that that's because space has some intrinsic direction. We think that that's because there's the Earth beneath us. If we were in the spacesuit, flying high above, we wouldn't know the difference between forward, backward, left, right, up, down. All the directions of space would be perfectly equal. Whereas, when it comes to time, there's a very strong difference between the past and the future. Individual human beings age in a certain direction, Benjamin Button notwithstanding. Species age in a certain direction. Society changes in a certain direction and doesn't change back. When I show you any one of these two pictures, you know which one was in the past, which one is in the future. 
That's the arrow of time. It's just the fact that the past and future are very, very different from each other. So why is that? Why is there this arrow of time? Well, we can, again, we can do science to that, too. We've come up with a term you might have heard. It's called entropy. The second law of thermodynamics is this wonderful law of physics that tells you why the past is different from the future. Entropy is this buzzword you may have heard. It's just disorderliness. Entropy is messiness. It's chaos. It's randomness. And it increases as time goes on. You take the egg unbroken, that's low entropy, that's orderly, that's organized. It's easy to break it. It's easy to scramble the broken egg. It is very hard to go backwards. It's very hard to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Entropy increases as time goes on. And the wonderful thing is that that one fact, the fact that entropy goes up as time passes, is the reason behind all of the differences between the past and the future, why you can remember the past but not the future, why you're born young and grow old. So the one major important fact about the entire universe is that chaos and disorder increase. This is a uh, bleakly existential, despairing view of the universe that science has given to us. But at least in the meantime, we can think about why it's like that. That's what scientists like to do. So why? does entropy increase? I'm going to explain a little bit why entropy increasing is behind the arrow, but what is entropy? Why does it increase? This was figured out by this guy, Ludwig Boltzmann. He lived the dream as far as physicists are concerned because he has an equation on his tombstone. I tell all of my students, you should always be thinking, what will your tombstone equation be someday? Boltzmann's equation on his tombstone is his definition of entropy. What Boltzmann and his friends said, look, if you believe in atoms, which not everyone did in the 1870s, but if you believe in atoms, I can tell you what entropy really is. It's because if I have cream and coffee, for example, when I look at it, I don't see every atom. I don't see every molecule, every particle. I just see the basic coarse features of this system. So there's ways that I could rearrange the atoms and molecules, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Entropy just tells you how many ways there are to rearrange the atoms without changing the overall looks of something. So when you have the cream and the coffee separate, that's low entropy, because as soon as you touch it, they start to mix together. When they're all mixed up, that is high entropy. There's many, many more ways for the cream and coffee molecules to be mixed together. So you want to know why entropy increases? Boltzmann says it's the simplest thing in the world. There are more ways to be high entropy than to be low entropy. You start something off, you put the cream separately from the coffee, it will mix together. It will not unmix. Just because there's more ways those atoms can be mixed up to look like on the right. But decades past, people thought about this very, very carefully. Boltzmann and his friends and people throughout the 20th century, they said, you know, what you're telling me, Mr. Boltzmann, Dr. Boltzmann, Herr Professor Dr. Boltzmann, is that there are more ways to be high entropy than low entropy, so entropy naturally increases. That explains to me why the entropy will be higher tomorrow. It doesn't explain to me why the entropy was lower yesterday. And they fought against this. People really you know, resisted this conclusion, but it turns out to be true. Just given the laws of physics, you can explain why entropy will be higher in the future, but not why it was lower in the past. You need something new. It turns out that what you need is exactly the same kind of explanation as to why there's an arrow of space here in this room. We have a directionality to space in this room because we live in the vicinity of an influential object called the Earth. We have an arrow of time in the universe because we live in the aftermath of an influential event called the Big Bang. Our universe started about 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, it's expanding, it's large, it's dense, it's 100 billion galaxies in our universe. And when it started, it was very, very, very low entropy. It was very highly organized. Nobody knows why. I want someone to figure out why. I would like to do it myself, but I have the feeling that I'm over the hill, and I'm not going to be able to do it. So instead, I go to events like this and try to inspire the youngsters in the audience. When you figure out why the early universe had low entropy and you're giving your Nobel Prize acceptance speech, I want you to remember this talk and give me some credit for putting you on that path. 
So let me just at least explain why we think that the Big Bang had a low entropy. Let me give you the very short history of the universe. Here's a photograph I took with my telescope of the Big Bang. All right, there may have been some computer graphics involved, but the Big Bang is not a place in the universe that just exploded. Sometimes you see these pictures of like an explosion in space, but the Big Bang was the whole universe. It was smooth everywhere. It was the same thing everywhere. One second after the Big Bang, we have data from this moment in the universe's history. We know what it was doing. It was hot, it was dense, it was smooth, and it was expanding to beat the bang. But the important point for us is that it was smooth. And you might think smooth sounds like high entropy, like the air in this room is smooth, the coffee and the cream, they're smooth. But when there's so much stuff, so much density packed so close together, it's actually very, very difficult to arrange things in a perfectly smooth configuration. This is very low entropy. This is a very orderly, organized beginning to the universe. Again, your job is to figure out why it's like that. As time goes on, the universe becomes lumpier. Gravity does its work. Gravity turns up the contrast knob on the universe. If there's a little region where there's slightly more stuff, that pulls even more stuff into it. So this is a photograph. This is taken by a satellite. This is the cosmic microwave background, the leftover radiation from the Big Bang, from the moment, 380,000 years after the beginning, when the universe first became transparent, when the light could travel from the early universe to us today. And what you see in these little patterns of splotches is slightly hotter and slightly cooler regions. The, uh, this has also been computer enhanced to make those differences visible. The differences from place to place are only one part in 100,000. The universe is still quite smooth, but gravity is starting to do its magic. And it continues to do that for another 13.8 billion years. I think I turned your lights off, sorry about that. Oh, they did it intentionally so you can see the picture, good. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is what you would get if you took your camera and you aimed it at an empty part of the sky and you left the shutter open. If your camera is attached to the Hubble Space Telescope, then what you will find out is that the sky is not that empty, that it is alive with other galaxies. We live in a galaxy, the Milky Way, with about 100 billion stars. There are about 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Every one of these splotches here is a galaxy with of order hundreds of billions of stars. Who knows how many science festivals are going on where they're looking at a picture of us. But the point is that gravity has increased the lumpiness of the universe. You now see individual galaxies, stars, planets. On very large scales, it's still smooth, but gravity has brought things together. It's also lit things up. You see these galaxies because stars are shining, because they are converting low entropy hydrogen and helium into more heavy elements and photons, increasing the entropy of the universe, but it can't last forever. If you wait long enough, about a quadrillion years, the stars will burn out. They will have no more nuclear fuel, will be nothing left with, left with nothing but black holes and rocks. Rocks would be planets, moons, dead stars, white dwarfs, brown dwarfs, etc. And those rocks, what are they gonna do? They're gonna fall into the black holes. They're gonna spiral in, and it'll be a dead, empty, dark universe. Again, science helps you overcome these uh, despairing future predictions. The black holes, it turns out, are also not completely black. Stephen Hawking, back in the 1970s, pointed out to us that black holes radiate. They give off energy into the surrounding cosmos. Everything is expanding away from everything else. We strongly believe these days that the expansion of the universe will never stop. So the black holes will evaporate. That takes about one Google years, in the old-fashioned sense of the word Google before the search engine came along. 10 to the 100 years from now, here's my uh, future picture of the universe. It will be empty. There will be nothing left, and that will last for infinity years. That is the history of the universe. So we live in the exciting, you know, in the Friday night part of the universe's history, the brief moment when things are active and fun. Now sometimes this, is, this can be a little depressing picture. Sometimes people want to know, well, if entropy is increasing, if that's the story of the universe, and entropy is just chaos and disorder, how do we get all these wonderfully complex, interesting things like you and me and the Seattle Science Festival and so forth? Well, the answer is that there's a difference between entropy and simplicity. Simplicity can come and go. 
So if you look at our picture of the universe, at early times it was low entropy, but it was also very, very simple, right? It's just white, it's just the same everywhere. At late times, it's very, very high entropy, but also very simple. It's just black everywhere, there's nothing going on. It's in between that the universe is interesting, complex, highly structured and highly ordered. And that is not an accident. That's not something that is just true for the universe. Even the cup of coffee, if you think about it, it starts out very simple, it ends up very simple. In between, when you see the tendrils of cream mixing into the coffee, that's where the complexity comes in. So it's not just that complexity is allowed by the growth of entropy. The reason we have complexity in the universe is because entropy is growing. Here we are sitting on the Earth, and you might be forgiven for thinking that the sun gives us energy. That's what the sun is good for, right? It, it radiates down on us and we use that energy. But we actually radiate back to the universe the same amount of energy that we get from the sun. The net amount of energy on Earth is approximately constant. What we're getting from the sun is entropy in a low, is energy in a low entropy form. For every one photon of light that we get from the sun, we radiate back 20 photons of light back to the universe. We have increased the entropy by 20 times in the course of chewing our cud, eating, thinking, growing, metabolizing, all of that stuff that keeps us alive, keeps us complex, keeps us interesting, is fueled by the fact that entropy is increasing. And indeed, if you think about theories of why there is life on Earth at all, one of the leading theories says that the early Earth's atmosphere was very low entropy. There was all of this extra entropy that could be created, but there was no simple way to do it. It required a long, complex series of chemical reactions. So in order to do that, the young Earth invented something we call life. And that life was a complex organism that could help the universe increase its entropy. So it really is entropy that is behind all of the fun stuff in the universe. Everything interesting about the universe is because we are riding a wave of increasing entropy from the Big Bang to the desolate, cold, boring future of the universe. Let me just give you one little philosophy argument. I said that one fact about the arrow of time is that you remember the past, but not the future. And then I said everything about the arrow of time is because entropy is increasing. So why is that true? What's the why does increasing entropy help you explain why you remember the past, but not the future? You might think the reason I remember the past is it has happened. <laughs> I do not remember the future because it has not happened yet. But a physicist will tell you, Einstein actually wrote this in one of his letters, that to a physicist, the past, present, and future are equally real. The laws of physics do not tell the difference between the past, present, and future. So what is actually going on? So here is a memory. This is my image of a memory, an egg broken. There's a lot of egg talk in, uh, when people talk about the arrow of time. So here's an egg broken on the sidewalk, and you can ask yourself, what will the future of this egg be? You don't know. It could wash away, it could just sit there and fester, a dog could come along and eat it. There's many possible futures for the egg. But if you ask yourself, where did the egg come from? What is the past of the egg? Most of us would say it used to be an unbroken egg and some unlucky person just dropped it on the sidewalk. Why is it that you are so much more predictive or specific about the past of the egg than the future? And the answer is not the laws of physics. As far as the laws of physics are concerned, there's an equal number of ways you could get that egg as things that could happen to the egg in the future. The difference is that we know something in addition to the laws of physics. We know about the low entropy Big Bang. We know the universe started 13.8 billion years ago in a low entropy state. So if you take the current situation of the egg and add to it the fact that we started in the Big Bang, you get a construction of where, what the history of the egg was like. It came from a chicken. Somebody dropped it. You can give the Big Bang credit for the fact that you can remember yesterday, but not tomorrow. But again, remember the most important thing I have to say here is that even though entropy is increasing, and that's why there's a difference between the past and the future, we don't know why. We don't know why the universe started off with a low entropy state. This, this feature of our everyday lives, that we're all born young and grow older, the, the feature that we can make choices about what to do tomorrow, but not make choices about what we did yesterday as much as we would like to do that. It's all because we live in a universe that is subject to this fact 
that happened 13.8 billion years ago. Cosmologists, people like me, would like to understand why. We would like to build a theory of the universe that makes this very natural and necessarily true. We haven't done that yet. Come back maybe next year, hopefully we'll have it all figured out. Thank you.